Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks so much for having me, guys. Um, yeah, amazing setup. Uh, awesome food, drinks, everything. Really uh, impressed by how well organized it is. Um, before I forget, actually on the way here, I saw this uh, flyer um, of an event that I heard about before, but I forgot that it was actually happening. It's called Pause Fest. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it. It's a, a one-week festival happening all over Melbourne. Uh, it's got something to do with uh, interactive art installations, uh, um, technology companies, digital agencies, startups, entrepreneurship. It sounds really awesome. I vaguely remember uh, one of the guys organizing and telling me that they're trying to establish something similar to South by Southwest in Melbourne. Uh, obviously a smaller scale, but it sounds really cool. You should check it out, Pause Fest. I think it started already on the 9th, so. Um, <coughs> all right, this is better. Um, so I got a, a snappy 25 minute talk and uh, hopefully uh, you guys stick around for a, a small Q&A session afterwards. I hope that uh, a few of you guys are into the publishing or magazine printmaking business and uh, we can have a bit of a chat afterwards. Uh, we can just throw in some feedback, some ideas, maybe a bit of insight into what you guys are doing. And uh, we can just talk a bit about making things for the real world instead of just um, online stuff. But of course, if you make a, a digital magazine and want to share something, then you're more than welcome to. Um, I also have to apologize that um, about my presentation. When I started putting together the presentation, I thought I'd throw in some animated GIFs to make it a bit more lighthearted, and I think I went down that rabbit hole a bit too far and it sort of <laughs> became a bit of a GIF fest. So if you feel motion sick, the toilet's over there. Um, so <coughs> for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kai, and I, I'm originally from Germany. I've been living in Melbourne for the better part of the last 12 or 13 years. And uh, for about the same amount of time, I've been working as a web design freelancer for clients in the US, in Germany, and in Australia. And uh, about 2012, late 2011, I decided to stop doing that. And uh, I was getting really tired and weary of um, making things for the online world, for the digital world, um, creating things that just lived as long as the next release um, cycle or the next version number. Um, and I uh, just wanted to create something that lived a bit longer than the average website. And so I decided to make something that lives in a real world, and that something became, <coughs> became Offscreen. Uh, if you don't know it, Offscreen is a magazine about people that uh, use the web and technology to be creative, to solve problems, and to build successful businesses. And um, it's a print publication, so there's no digital version of it. It re it's released uh, around three times a year. Sometimes I can squeeze in four issues, but most of the time I just um, I manage to make three issues a year. Uh, I'm up to issue number 10 now, so I had my anniversary issue uh, published two weeks ago. And uh, across all issues, I've so far sold around 34,000 copies, um, plus minus uh, maybe a couple of thousand that I gave away for free. Um, and there's no team behind it, so it's a one... Uh, man operation. I do everything from editing and designing and publishing and marketing and distributing the whole thing, uh, mostly from home and sometimes from a, a, a shared office space in. Um, this is really loud. Uh, shared office space in Fitzroy. Um, probably important to say to note that uh, the magazine itself is actually not made in Australia. It's actually produced and shipped from Berlin, and the reason for that I'll uh, go into a bit later. If you work online, you probably know that most of us like to share our process. We you know, write blog posts about why we made our website responsive or how we decrease the latency of our database infrastructure. And in fact, if you take a step back and look at the web from, uh, from above, you notice that um, the whole thing, the whole internet thing is built uh, upon sharing and upon opening up, um, collaboratively working with other people to uh, improve the status quo. And uh, when I started getting into print and when I started exploring stuff with magazines and publishing, I realized that uh, there's different rules that apply in that world. And a lot of people, uh, or the opposite, actually nobody really wants to talk about the practicalities and the realities of making a magazine. And um, the reason for that is that uh, magazines were born in a different era. Um, if you look at the average newsstand, if you go to a, a news agent and you look at the newsstand, uh, most of the magazines there are published by giant publishing houses with massive overheads. 
um, struggling really desperately to come to terms with the new rules of the internet economy. And so, um, long story short, it's really difficult getting people to open up um, and tell you um, what works, what doesn't work, and tell you how actually a magazine comes to be. That's my experience anyway. And so when I launched um, the first issue of Offscreen, I decided to um, try a different approach, and I decided to document my transition from web designer to uh, print publisher um, through my blog and pretty much write about everything that happens to me uh, and share what happens on, um, on my blog and also through Twitter and Facebook and try to engage with people, uh, with my audience um, that way as well. And since then I've written a ton of blog posts about the behind the scenes stuff, what happens, uh, uh, my process, failures, successes, um, general thoughts on independent publishing and uh, figuring it, out, it all out on my own. And in an unintended way, the, the magazine or the brand off-screen has somehow become almost more well-known for me being that guy that shares everything than the actual content of the magazine. And so tonight I thought I'd um, just uh, share a few bits and pieces from my blog with you, um, talk a bit about what's happening behind the scenes of a magazine in, in, um, in the hope that you guys get some insight into what it means to make a magazine in, in, in the digital age. <coughs> And so the first thing I want to talk about is, logically, uh, transparency. A uh, contributor of a, of a previous issue once said that uh, peop people don't buy um, what you do, they buy why you do it. And I found this to be quite true for off-screen as well. Um, as I said, I shared a ton of stuff, um, really personal stuff on my blog uh, about the making of the, of the magazine and um, you know, from how much money I make um, in one year to uh, having an emotional meltdown because a cover uh, print didn't turn out the way I wanted to. And it seems that every time I write about that sort of stuff, um, people, whether it's good or bad, people seem to get more attached to me and to the brand off screen. And so um, the result is that <coughs> I now have this really friendly and really um, almost intimate relationship with my readers. Um, and so communicating honestly and openly uh, with my my audience creates this mutual environment, this, em or this environment of mutual trust and authenticity. Um, I think without that, I couldn't have actually made 10 issues of Offscreen. And so one of the biggest advantages as an independent producer, whether it's a magazine producer or whatever it is, independent, is that you can create this really close and really special relationship with your audience or with your clients. Um, and that relationship is so special that uh, much bigger competitors, maybe much more successful competitors, um, can never really achieve. It's, they're really envious of that, of that relationship, I found. Um, but it doesn't really stop, stop there. With, um, with the stuff that I was doing, um, by sharing my process and by letting people have a look behind the scenes, more and more um, colleagues or more and more people in the same industry started to contact me and said, oh, hey, I really like what you guys are doing, assuming that there's a whole team there. But they basically just said, oh, we really like what you guys do. Um, we want to share our insight as well. Um, is there a platform where we can talk a bit more about how we do things? Um, and so I set up this little Facebook group um, called In the Publisher Club, <coughs> where nowadays we have around 60 or so independent print publishers talk about everything print-related and publishing-related. And uh, it's become a really nice active community where we can just vent and uh, sometimes talk about some challenges, some you know, distributors, uh, print techniques. Uh, and it's become really a really interesting place for us to uh, share things. Um, and it's cool seeing people come together and learn from each other that way. And I've got to be honest, I'm quite proud of creating this sort of legacy beyond you know, my, my own product. Um, and it all starts with sharing. It really all starts with just writing a blog post about what you just did and why you did it. <coughs> uh, many of you guys have probably heard the saying that you only need around a thousand true fans to make a living with your work. And um, I found this, I'm not sure if the, the, thousand, the number a thousand always applies or whether that's higher or lower in certain industries, but I found it to be fairly accurate with off-screen as well. And so with every issue I put out, there's a really vocal and really excited core group of people that um, are getting you know, super hyped up on, on, on social media about the launch of a new issue. 
And I don't know them personally. I can recognize their, their Twitter avatars or their names or their, their email addresses, but I never really met them. But at the same time, I know that those guys are my, my real fans, my true fans, and I have to put in the extra bit of effort to actually acknowledge their support every single time because that creates people like this guy here, um, Oliver. Um, he was so excited about the second issue of Offscreen, and obviously that's a, a while ago now. Um, but he was so excited about the second issue of Offscreen that he bought 10 copies and uh, resold those copies uh, within his own group of friends. And so he went around London um, to visit his colleagues at work and his friends and uh, got them to buy a copy of Offscreen. Um, and he didn't stop there. He actually went back a week later and interviewed those guys about their experience with Offscreen, what they liked about it, why they liked it, and then created a Tumblr about it. And I find that really awesome. Um, you know, without any incentives, this guy was just becoming the best salesperson ever. And uh, so people like Oliver are the measuring stick of how well or how badly I'm doing. And so as, a, as, a, as an independent publisher, your job is to basically create a thousand Olivers. <coughs> um, as mentioned, there's no team behind off-screen, and so naturally I have to spread my th myself quite thinly. Um, when I started research into making magazines, of course I went to Magnation and a few other shops and collected magazines and let them pile up on my desk and uh, looked through them, w amazing magazines, really meticulously well executed, beautiful um, products. And of course they were a massive inspiration, but they were all also very utterly um, frightening, like utterly scary to look at because how could I as one person without prior experience in print as well uh, create anything of uh, an equal level of awesomeness or anything that people would respect, right? And turns out I couldn't and I didn't really have to. Um, being a one-man band means that you can in fact play several instruments at the same time, but it also means that you'll never be as cool as this dude. I consider myself more like this guy. Um, <laughs> see how he's got a, a bag uh, around his, strapped around his chest asking for shrapnel. Um, I think I couldn't have, couldn't have found a better gift to represent what I'm doing. Um, in practical terms, this means that, sure, the writing in the magazine could be a bit better, you know, the, the photo retouching could be a bit more precise, the, uh, the marketing, I could put a lot more effort into marketing, could be a better salesperson. Um, but the thing is, I combine all of those roles into one person, and so it is what it is, it's a one-man magazine. And it turns out people actually like it, not despite of it, but they like it because of it. And um, they really like having all these little quirks in every issue, and they like having a personality behind it, they like having a face behind the magazine. Because with most magazines, they don't. And so, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that don't let your heroes intimidate you. You can actually achieve a lot with a little, as long as you don't get sidetracked by the achievements of uh, other people. <coughs> Um, the great thing about uh, indie publishing is that you can pretty much take 90% of the rules that exist about traditional publishing and throw them out the window. If you don't want to have uh, articles or writers for your magazine, you just make a beautiful magazine with photos only. Uh, if you uh, don't like the small uh, book, fiddly book uh, format of off-screen, you can just create a newspaper-sized magazine with beautiful photos and giant headlines and slap a cover on it and call it a magazine, right? So there's no real rules anymore. Um, people just trying different things all the time, and that's exactly what I did. Um, when I started, I didn't really have like a master plan or a business plan. In fact, I had no plan at all. Um, all I wanted to do was to make something other than a website. And so I jumped, I actually didn't know how to use InDesign, so I actually jumped on a website called uh, lynda.com, which is uh, this um, video tutorial thing where you subscribe and then pay 20 or 30 bucks, and then you can watch as many videos as you want on all different types of software. So I, I spent two to three weeks watching everything they had on typography, on InDesign, on prepress, on color management. Um, so I really started from scratch. And I think um, the, the scary part wasn't so much um, having to learn all these new, new tools or these new skills. I think the scary part was admitting to myself and admitting to others that I'm now a complete beginner again. You know, I start from scratch. Um, because, I, you know, I'm 33 now, after 10 or 12 years working in a certain industry, you, you sort of think of yourself as a, I don't know, senior or whatever it is, but you don't want to go backwards, right? Um, so I think the scary part is to just start from scratch. There's a, um, a really 
awesome article that I read on the weekend. Um, it's about perfectionism, and I want to show you a quick quote. It says, success means having to forgive oneself the horrors of the first draft. And I think that's really true, uh, because in, in retrospect, um, in retrospect, um, I'm not really proud of the first issue of Offscreen. You know, when I look through, there's so many mistakes and so many um, f things wrong with the photos, with everything, really. Um, and I'm glad it's sold out because I hate handing it out to people now. Um, but it's, it's great if I look at them in front of me and I see you know, all the issues from 1 to 10, it's great to see my own progression in a way. It's great to see how, uh, how much effort I put in and how much I learned and how much joy I got out of it. And um, I think starting with, with an I don't know is a pretty powerful motivator to um, prove to yourself what you're capable of. Um, <coughs> Of course, a lot of us are scared uh, when we try new things, right? We all, no one likes to fail and no one likes to be made a fool of in front of others. Uh, but what many forget is that when you leave your familiar circle and your familiar industry and group of friends or whatever, and you start moving into a new environment, um, you always bring a unique set of skills with you that uh, allow you to stand out, stand out from the rest. Um, and at the same time, not knowing the established rules in that industry that you're entering um, allows you to look at problems from a different angle, right? And you try to solve things differently. So um, being a bit of a rebel gives you a chance to make a difference and turn some heads, right? Uh, to give you an example, um, so us, uh, us folks in the, in the web community, we usually... Uh, come across a lot of situations where we see room for improvement and then we usually go about developing tools or developing some sort of software solution to um, improve upon that situation, right? Um, I would say that I brought my problem-solving skills that I learned in, the, in that industry, in the web industry, with me into the publishing industry. And so <coughs> when it came to managing um, orders and subscriptions for off-screen, I... Um, couldn't really find a piece of software that I liked and that worked exactly the way I wanted it to. Um, and so I got a developer friend of mine here in Melbourne to help me develop this custom auto management system that now powers the back, uh, the back end of Offscreen. And it allows me to manage orders really easily. It allows me to keep, keep tabs on subscriptions. Uh, most importantly, I work with my shipper in Berlin um, so that it, this tool actually exports the data in a way that he can handle it and he can actually process it process the data through his own system. So basically, once a week, I send him a CSV file, a comma-separated value file, with all the addresses of the orders that came in over the last seven days, and he processes that file through his own system, prints um, these nice-looking shipping labels, uh, sticks them on them, and then sends the magazines around the world. And uh, what I'm saying is that without my tech background, I probably would have looked at the problem that I had and would have tried to find uh, a software solution that already existed and it probably would have been really shit. And so I think with my approach, I um, made the op whole operation possible because I can now be in Melbourne. Uh, I can you know, tell a shipper halfway around the world um, through pressing a couple of buttons what he needs to do. And so that's a good example for how uh, when you come from a different industry, you bring a very different view of things uh, with you. Um, funnily enough, uh, dozens of other ship, uh, sorry, do dozens of other publishers have since uh, contacted me and asked me whether they can use the same um, auto management system. And it shows that um, you know, a, a small idea of one person can sometimes address an issue of, of many other people in a way that you didn't anticipate. Um, so don't underestimate being an outsider. Um, traditionally, magazines, um, some of you probably know, traditionally magazines are sold through a distributor. So you have a, a middleman that tries to uh, get as many copies of your magazine into as many shops as possible. Um, and um, I'll show you how usually the split works. So usually <coughs> the publisher would get 40% of the cover price. Uh, the, the distributor takes a cut in the middle, and the retailer, the, the shop that sells your magazine, keeps the, the remaining 40%. And of course, if you run a magazine that um, relies on the cover price to make a living or to make it sustainable, this is not a very efficient way of doing it. And so I tried to eliminate the, uh, the distributor. I actually eliminated all the other two parts, both parts, by going straight to the reader, obviously through my website. And um, you know, it comes pretty natural being um, a, a, um, a magazine about web people. And so I focused on creating a really nice website, a good experience online, um, and try not to rely on other companies to sell my product. 
and of course that helped me again um, be in direct touch with my with my users and help me establish a relationship what I mentioned before and so as a result uh, today I sell around 75% of all the magazines that I make uh, directly to my readers through my website and the remaining 25% I sell through a network of maybe 60 or 70 shops or so around the world that I most of them um, supply directly um, through my shipper in Berlin. So usually they tell me, okay, send us 20 copies. I think we can tell, sell 20 copies and then I get my printer to send a box to them. Uh, to be fair, I have to say that uh, in the last six months or so, I started a few trials with smaller distributors to get um, more copies, more magazines into shops, especially in the US, which is a really hard market to crack. Um, but doing the distribution myself, I learned pretty quickly that, uh, yeah, poor guy, huh? Um, I learned pretty quickly that shipping physical products around the world is really fucking hard. Um, unlike in the digital space where, you know, digital sp the delivery in the digital space happens through uh, a couple of clicks and you don't really know what's going on behind the scenes, but if you deliver physical products, you have to deal with uh, third-party companies that are at the end of that uh, sort of delivery of your product, right, and you, you rely on the, satis uh, the satisfaction of your customers, relies on that third-party company to do their job right. And so as a result, I have a lot, of, um, a lot of respect for anyone that does any shipping, any real product shipping around the world, and I'm a lot more patient uh, when, you know, something from Amazon doesn't arrive right away. And in turn, I lost all my respect for the p uh, faceless postal services of the world. I can tell you some really um, interesting horror stories there. Um, coming from digital, the uh, finality of print is something that takes a lot of getting used to. Um, as a web designer, you usually work maybe a few months or so with a client, uh, and then at the end of that, that period, you create uh, you know, a few text files. I mean, it's code. You have a few text files, and if you're a designer, you maybe have a few images, a few JPEGs. And I don't know how you deliver it. You uplo upload it to a server or share it on GitHub, um, and that's it. But with print, you sort of work towards this freakishly giant beast of a file that you export from uh, InDesign, which takes forever, and then you upload it to the server of your printer, which takes, I don't know, a day, thanks to Australia's awesome broadband network. <laughs> um, and then you find five typos, and then you do the whole thing again for like a week. Um, and so what, what I'm saying is that in print, there is no iteration process. There is no, uh, let's put this thing online and fix, as we, uh, fix things as we go. Because as a web developer or designer, you basically put things up there and you sort of hope for it to break because then you can fix it and you can improve it. Uh, and you can make uh, decisions based on um, data, not on assumptions, right? Um, but with print, of course, that's not possible. And um, the result is that nothing you produce will ever be perfect. So every single issue I have produced has a lot of uh, typos, a lot of colors being off, a lot of issues with all sorts of things. Uh, not just because I screw up, but also because printing things, uh, like with print, everything turns out differently every time you do it. Um, there's tiny little things like the, the temperature and the, the humidity in the printing facility changes the way the ink um, adjusts to the paper surface. Or there was a case where um, um, the, the book binder um, had actually changed the, comp the chemical composition of the glue and so the cover page didn't stick properly to, to the rest of the magazine. And uh, another story where my paper, man, my paper supplier changed paper mills, uh, sorry, changed the location of the paper mills. So they moved from uh, France to Denmark, I think. And uh, they used different water and different uh, recycled material to create that recycled stock. And it turned out completely differently. So I had to change, uh, choose another uh, stock type. Um, <coughs> All this stuff is what makes print really awesome, but it's also what makes it really, really frustrating. Okay, let's be honest here. I'm not really um, reinventing the wheel. Um, you know, the, the magazine is, magazines have been around for a long time, and the stuff that you read in off-screen is something that you can probably read on blogs, on e in e-books, on podcasts, and videos. Um, it's not really anything super innovative and super, super new. But I found that as soon as you take those stories and the content and you put it on paper and you start shipping it around the world, for a lot of people it becomes sort of more real in a way. Um, and there's a little story that I um, keep telling people. Um, it's about um, this guy who I interviewed for a, pre a previous issue 
And uh, when the issue came out, he bought a few more copies for his, uh, for his mum and for his friends and family. And when he gave the copy of, uh, of the magazine to his mum, it instantly made her cry. And so this is a guy who's pretty well known. He's pretty you know, f famous in our circles. He's uh, running a pretty big business. He's got employers. He's really successful. Even to his mum, the success of a son must be pretty obvious because he's got you know, the usual signs like the big house and the car and whatever. But for, her, for his mum, the success of a son somehow became real when she saw um, the name of a son printed on the cover of a magazine. You know, and I think that's the emotional power that emanates from real products that we just don't get with anything else. It's uh, that relationship. I think our relationship with digital products will never be as intimate as with something that has been manufactured and or made by hand and then shipped around the world, the world directly to people's home. <coughs> um, most magazines out there are still running on the old business model of advertising, right? Um, this means that. Um, their most important metric is the circulation number. Based on that number, they will charge a business X amount of money to print their logo or their name on a piece of paper. Um, that's why you have, uh, in the States, for example, where it's really bizarre, you have uh, subscription deals where you can subscribe to six months of the Time magazine for 20 bucks and you get a free lawnmower. It's a really bizarre concept. And so what differentiates uh, indie publishing is um, that we don't work for big businesses, we work for the readers because the readers will vote with their wallet whether our product is worth it or not. And um, so what we're seeing in indie publishing is that we uh, have a much higher cover price um, but equally higher production values. Um, and at the same time, um, me and a few other magazines, we still work with businesses but try different approaches than the usual advertising um, that we know of. And so with Offscreen, I <coughs> decided that I didn't want to have uh, ugly ad pages you know, disrupt your reading experience with Offscreen. I really wanted to provide a really subtle and really calm environment. And so I asked these eight companies whether they wanted to sponsor the first issue. And uh, they all, pretty much all they got was, was a black page. And I said that you don't have any artwork on there. I'm just going to put your logo and a, s a short description about your company. And that's it. Um, and that that's pretty much all it is. There's uh, uh, eight black pages in the center of the magazine and a dedicated section where I feature all the sponsors. And uh, the money that I make, not with the first issues, but the, f the, the last six or so, um, the money that I made through these sponsors then now cover the production of the magazine. And I think the result is pretty interesting because since issue number one, I had people contacting me via email and Twitter uh, to tell me that for the first time ever, they read every single word of a magazine, including those in the ads. And I find that, really find, find that really interesting because you can uh, make something more subtle and, and less in your face and people pay more attention to it, not um, despite of it, but because of it. You know, they actually like paying attention to subtle things more than when it says, you know, buy me. And I find that really interesting. Um, <coughs> being independent also means that you have the freedom to do uh, a few experiments here and there. And so last year, at the end of last year, I tried a um, pay what you want experiment where I let people decide um, how much they want to pay for the magazine. And here's how it works. So this is a, a screenshot where you can see on the left, uh, number one, you could uh, pick a, a magazine, pick an issue. <coughs> and then in the middle, there's a slider where you slide up or down uh, default is $22, which is the regular price of off-screen, and then you slide it to the left, and it would change to, I think, a minimum of $5, and the maximum to the right of $38. And as you were sliding down that little knob, um, the text underneath would tell you how sustainable your choice would be. So if you choose $5, it would say, um, this will not cover even sending you the magazine, so I will make a loss. And uh, if everyone does that, then the magazine is out of business in you know, a few weeks or months. And so as you go higher, that makes it more sustainable. And you know, you, with the $38 per copy, I could probably hire a few people and I could make it more frequently and blah, blah, blah. And of course, uh, because I share everything, I also published a blog post and uh, created this um, super uh, scientifically accurate graph. Uh, all the black dots are sales. And uh, the, the experiment was online for 18 hours. So I made around 72 sales. Um, as you can see, a lot of people, so the red area down there means that people uh, um, are choosing a price where I'm losing money. The blue line um, shows you the average price paid by all people that, that uh, bought a copy on that day. And the green line is the average uh, the regular price. 
Um, and as you can see, there are a lot of people um, buying a really cheap price, uh, uh, buying a, on, a, on a really cheap price. Um, but what's interesting here is that um, the average price is sort of just above that losing money segment. And I think that is because people don't want to feel like they're stealing from me. People, f There's a, a psychological barrier for most people anyway that um, they don't want to feel like they left you out of pocket. Um, what's really important to say um, about this experiment is that I didn't open it up to future issues. So all the people that really love my magazine, that really want to give me more money, uh, have already purchased uh, the issues that I had on offer. Um, and that's really, really important because if, uh, you know, the thousand true fans that I told you about before, if they participated in this and they would al already have all the copies, if they participated in this, they would probably choose a much higher price. Um, and I do have a, a little um, special category, you call, the, call them patrons, where you can pay a hundred bucks for a copy and I print your name in the back of the magazine. So that's for like the super fans. Um, but yeah, so why do this experiment? Um, because it's fun and because I can. Um, and also because it gave me a lot of exposure online, so a lot of uh, readers talked about it, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, other publishers thought it was really interesting and they shared the link, so I got a bit more um, you know, buzz out of it. <coughs> but it's also, uh, I mean, I guess the, the, the lesson that I learned here is that there will always be opportunists and always be poor students, right, that buy a, a, a copy of your magazine at the cheapest possible price. And who doesn't like to score a bargain? So I, d I don't feel bad at all about um, having given away you know, copies for a much cheaper price. Um, when I tell, talking about price, when I tell people about off-screen uh, not existing as a digital version and uh, costing $22 per copy, uh, a lot of people give me a bit of a frown, of course, um, but then when they see the magazine in real life, when they touch it and they smell it and they read some stories, a lot of them usually get it. And so, I think the future of magazines as a content delivery model is moving from those really cheaply produced throwaway magazines towards those more expensive, high quality, almost luxury items. <coughs> and I actually read a, a really awesome editor, uh, editor's note in a magazine called Scrag End the other day, uh, a magazine coming from Sydney, I think two guys, a uh, food magazine, really nice. And uh, in the editorial, or the editor's note, he said that in the same way that the automobile allowed the horse to become a creature of leisure rather than of labor, so too has digital publishing moved from traditional publishing into the realm of luxury. And I found that to be <coughs> uh, very true. So nowadays, you know, magazines have become almost like a luxury item. Uh, it's as if you buy a really expensive, nice hardcover book um, you spend money on, on things that you really care about and uh, you want to support uh, the people that make it. But of course, I also spend most of my day on behind the screen. Of course, you know, to actually make off screen, I have to spend my eight, ten hours a day on my screen. And um, so people always assume that I don't like ebooks or have anything, have something against digital publishing. It's nonsense, of course. But um, this little treat really is nicely sums it up for me. <coughs> It's a nice way to sort of summarize where we are today and how weird it sometimes feels. Um, I think many of us are starting to realize that um, consuming everything on a screen um, sometimes feels quite unsubstantial or, or temporary at times, right? Um, I think there's a, some studies as well that suggest that consuming things on paper is actually consumed much more thoroughly and remembered much longer than their digital counterparts. And as I said before, I read a lot of stuff on screen and I consume a lot of content on screen. Um, but some things just feel a lot more solid when you consume them on paper, right? And I think that's where the future of print lies. I think uh, maybe it's time to start thinking about paper versus screen, not as old versus new, but as complementary and different devices, each stimulating a particular mode of thinking for a particular time of our day. Thank you.